Hello and welcome to the Life After Diets podcast. I'm Sarah Dosanj, psychotherapist and author of the book, I Can't Stop Eating. And I'm Stephanie Michelle, binge recovery health coach. If you feel out of control around food, we get it because we've been there. Thank you for joining our conversations about how to make peace with food and feel more comfortable in our bodies. Now on to this week's episode. We've got a guest on today, haven't we, Steph? Another British guest. Oh yeah, it is another British guest. <laughs> they're, they're the ones who have responded. We've got some upcoming. We have. And that's British guests. Over, just over half our listeners are American. It's still America's our biggest listener group. Yeah, we're... We'll represent shortly. Everyone stay tuned. Indeed. But today, today we have a quite a quite a high profile British guest. We do, and it feels like you're making an announcement, but people will have seen her name in the title. But today we have Susie mm. Orbach on the podcast. Susie is a psychotherapist, psychoanalyst, and she wrote a book called "Fat Is a Feminist Issue" in 1978, and she basically started the conversation that we are having 44 mm. years later. Mm. Good math. You must have pre-mathed that. Um, yeah, the intersection of bodies and feminism. Yeah, and even just the deeper meaning in terms of how we experience our bodies and some of the pressures that we face at the societal level. Yeah, she also wrote a book called Bodies, and she's also written a book called On Eating. Susie's other claim to fame is she was Princess Diana's therapist. So she's given us lots of secrets on this podcast. <laughs> no, she Just, is. You have to listen all the way to the end. Yeah, all the way to the end when she will tell us things that you never knew about one of the most fascinating women in history. <laughs> no, I mean, we, we joked about asking her about it, but Susie has a way about her where you just wouldn't dare. She's always been quite rightly very tight lipped about what she knows about Diana. <laughs> but in this conversation we have with her, she speaks about empowerment as that and of having desire and not being afraid of desire in a couple of ways that I found really interesting and um, we hope you enjoy it. Hi Susie. Hello Sarah and Stephanie. Thanks for coming on. Thank you for coming on. We feel honored to have you on this podcast because as far as I'm concerned you are like the OG when it comes to some of the conversations that we're having today particularly in our communities as well. Maybe it makes sense to start with I know this is the book that you always get asked about and you've written so many books since, but Fat is a Feminist Issue is the first book that I ever read of yours. And that was the one that was published in 1978, if I'm correct. And it had a pretty big impact at the time. I think I heard you say once in an interview that you thought you would be able to write this book and you would be done. There would be this kind of momentum and it would be the beginning of change. And has it turned out how you expected? <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> I mean, sadly. Look, I was naive. I was young. I thought books mattered. And of course they matter. But what I hadn't really taken account of and what still enrages me is how successful the industries are, which spread body hatred, mm. which, you know, enter into girls and women's psyches and increasingly boys and men and which make it very hard for anybody to feel safe in their bodies so I've written I, I thought Fifi was all I ever had to say about this but I then went on to write about anorexia and hunger strike and then on eating and then I've written bodies twice I've written that book twice because the continual assaults on women mm. everything from our understanding of rape as a weapon of war to fetuses having rights in certain American states um, over the mother's rights if they require cancer treatment to the latest smashing of Roe v. Wade. I, I mean, it seems to me that bod women's bodies are continually under um, assault and dieting will be the generation of body hatred, whether it's here or around the world, which has happened, is a piece of the story. And it's a piece of the personal story that undermines and zaps our brains and takes things away from us. And I think the thing that's so great about giving up dieting is that you get a certain amount of agency back. Mm -hmm. It's not easy, 
but you get to make that struggle on your own terms, even if you still have the viciousness coming at you. Mm -hmm. You get to make the struggle on your own terms, not in somebody else's terms. And with women who, who are like-minded. Yeah. Hmm. And, and you, you'd say about how today it feels like things are worse when it comes to the pressures on us to change our bodies. And at the same time, there seems to be more people that are open to the idea of not dieting, because that was quite a revolutionary thing to suggest. Maybe we don't need to diet. I mean, now we've, I think so many of us have heard this message in other places, even if we don't fully Thank accept God. it. Thank God. I mean, yes. good, I know, but it doesn't, but you know, it comes concealed, right? It comes concealed in living on bone broth or vegan diets or um, stuff from the health food shops, you know, which is just a part of the food industry for goodness sake, or the pharma <laughs> industry. Um, so yes, the really revolutionary idea behind it was being able to recognize this incredibly beautiful thing called the, a prompt for hunger and being able to respond to it and being able to respond to it in a way that lovingly and sweetly and, and differently each time because it's going to be different. And it's a very good metaphor for responding to other kinds of emanations from self you know, emotional needs and other physical needs. So I think it's it's a very important and liberating idea. It isn't just giving up diet. It's actually locating the thing, which is hunger and figuring out what, what our various hungers are for. Well, there's a quote that you, I read in an interview that you had done and you spoke about hunger in another terminology of desire. Orbeck argues that much of the problem lies in an increasing inability to manage desire. And that sends anorexic and compulsive eaters as two sides of the same coin. So the former afraid of appetite and desire so much that they try to deny it. And the latter eating prophylactically before they get into the unbearable position of experiencing need. Um, what what makes desire and that hunger so terrifying to us? Look, I, I am a psychoanalyst. So I'm obviously going to look at origins. And I think the problem at this point in history is that, and it's still women who mainly raise babies, there's that women's own uh, relationship to her body has been so, at this point, so battered so critique that the very body and the very sense of relish that she might bring to very early feeding situations is compromised by her own anxiety and by the sets of rules that all mothers are now supposed to fit into so that they can get their you know genes back on or mm. so they don't make their babies too fat whatever it is but the the, the idea that the desire of a mother to meet her baby's needs unproblematically, I think has been so disrupted because the mother's own needs are disrupted. And therefore there's a kind of double whammy in terms of how does that infant who's entering a world and the world is entirely composed of whoever feeds and holds that baby, how do they, the nature of how they enter that world is, is, if you like, compromised by hesitation or anxiety that's coming at it. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's also delight, but there's, but it's not straightforward. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you've had this before, Susie, but because I work with eating disorders, a number of clients have told me that they haven't found out until they were an adult that their mother had an eating disorder, like in their conscious mind, completely unaware of it. So some people might argue like a genetic tendency, maybe a vulnerability to it, but I'm just curious. There's no how... such thing as a genetic vulnerability. There is an epigenetic issue with, with mothers who in times of famine, like the Second World War, there's very strong evidence that the mothers who had who were starving in, in the first trimester and went on to have babies who were um, underweight, those babies got big because of it, it changed the whole um, structure of what got promoted. But it's not genetic in an eating disorder. I mean, 
you don't that's like saying hysteria is genetic well then why wouldn't we have hysterias now you know it's these are these are complaints of our time actually actually going on a very very long time but partly because it is transmitted in both the mother child relationship but also the school teacher relationship now they're everybody at school supposed to teach children nutrition but that isn't a clean teach mm -hmm. that is fraught with anxiety especially when they're doing these bmi tests as though that was a relevant category um so there's a whole lot of pressure on food and the feeding situation and what's going in our bodies that's really interesting to me and as hard as it is for me to admit when i had my first daughter who just turned 11 a few months ago i was in the thick of my own eating disorder and she was a hungry infant and from the moment she came out i thought she was eating too much i was nursing her and i was just beside myself at the amount she was eating and i felt um i was panicking and i tried to control the amount that she was having to my infant um and she was hungry and i feel when you're talking about this like the way that 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 must infiltrate right away that there's something of that relationship with food that is automatically like fraught with something that I can hear that and say like, yeah, that started immediately for me in, in that relationship I've been since trying to repair um, with her, but that that must be coded somewhere, you know, that there was a, a lot of times withholding or, or some kind of control or structuring or, or even my own sense of anxiety around her eating. Well, it's fantastic that you've been able to figure that one out, right? Because we can't do much without knowing stuff. I mean, we can't know everything. And it's very interesting, the mums who, who don't tell their kids, which I understand. I mean, I, I, I have mums in my own practice that want to eat around their kids in a very easy, flowy way so that they don't get any hint of the fact of what they actually do or did do or were. But the culture is now so big that the kids are getting anyway, right? So it's yes. like, a, it's a double whammy. And I so think the we important do? thing to be able to do is to be able to say, yeah, it's really hard to withstand all this pressure, you know, but the only sane thing is to do that. Yeah. And to try and have friends who do that too. Because is that the, it, the pressure isn't going to stop. It's okay. too profitable. If you want connection and support around any of the topics we talk about on the podcast, we would love for you to join our membership community. Members have access to monthly online support groups, a private Facebook group, live episode recordings, and member-only Q&As. If you would like to join us, please head to lifeafterdietspodcast.com forward slash community. Now let's get back to the episode. Yeah, that's kind of the, the, it's like, what do you do with this? It's, is it a matter of resilience and finding like-minded people and just keeping our heads on straight? Um, because it seems like the, these things are getting bigger, right? We were, and I think it, I think it is. I think it's, you know, I'm part of a, a generation where a bunch of us were, you know, we were, all, we all did this and therefore we don't talk about diets and we don't diet. And I think just being bold about our appetites and trying to reinforce it with each other and with our kids um, is really important. I just wanted to tell you a bit about what happened for me when I read Fifi. It was before I was training to be a therapist and I was in a real battle with food and my body. And what it did, what it opened my eyes to that I'd never thought of before was actually unconscious things that are going on. And I know now in the work that I do, that sounds obvious but it's really not obvious to people so many people think I certainly thought I've just got no willpower I'm just too hungry I'm just out of control that's just who I am and so when you spoke about um safety and particularly like safety from like uh sexual objectification when I first read that I was like no like no I, 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 I miss I miss being found attractive in that way but when I really thought about that more when I so I was very um, slim up until my mid twenties. And that was when I started to struggle with food. And when I was 19, I moved to London. And the first week I was in London twice, I was grabbed by a random stranger man on the street. And I can remember getting on tubes and there would just be a guy normally just staring, you know, in that really kind of intimidating way, or they've come and sit next to you. All of that went away when I gained weight. So did some of the attention, which I had liked from where I wanted it to come from, but 
I remember thinking I, it had never occurred to me that there could be any upside to gaining weight because I thought it was the most terrible thing at that time. Well, and I'm sure you, you didn't think there's anything problematic with being your ideal size. No. Exactly. No, no exactly that. Um, and these are the kinds of conversations that I hear coming up more. I also, my theory as well, and around why so many women really resonated with what you write, Susie, and what you say, is that I think there's an enormous relief sometimes when we hear, oh, it's not just that I'm wrong. There's all these other things and influences that I just have no idea about. I think that really helps to reduce the shame. And it's quite empowering in a way, even if we're still up against these enormous pressures. Nothing's yeah, I think it changed. is. I agree. I think it is. It does give you a sense of your own capacity to do things, even if it's even if because you're not buying into something in a just mindless way. You're you're actually engaging with, you know, fundamental questions about desire to go back to Stephanie's point, you know. Why am I afraid of desire? Am I afraid of desire? Can I dare to want? Can I, you know, it's very interesting being this old because really I never ever get looked at, obviously. And that is a loss as well as a, a relief, right? Mm. Yeah. Because it's so much part of being raised to be a girl or woman about how one has to have eyes on you all the time because otherwise you don't exist and you have to always be looking to camera etc cetera, etc cetera. it's really interesting when that goes I mean it goes when you're quite young actually it's been gone for a long time <laughs> but it's um it's you know it's not nothing because yeah. it's so much part of identity yeah, and yeah. I think you you know I value being engaged with for my vibrancy or energy or whatever yeah yeah is that what we move towards like a shift of identity and the movement away from the value of body as identity correct and not everybody's going to be vivacious people are going i mean they're you know obviously in any kind of friendship group one has the people whose other qualities are much more apparent and they're quieter or whatever but yes, I think we need a real shift in identity markers. And I think the sort of increasing identity markers of being this and this and this and this and this are very difficult. Yeah. Why, why do you think it's so difficult? It's, it's almost like if you have, if the body will always come first as the preferred source of that identity, um, even where I've worked with people who are exploring new ways of valuing themselves, they, there's still this almost undertone of, but if I could have the body and get the attention that way and identify through that, I would. Um, why is it so compelling? Well, I don't know. I mean, we could say that we, we, we don't receive our babies properly. We could say that we turn, you know, human beings into iconic figures and celebrities and stars and all of that nonsense, right? And we, you know, when I look at my grandchildren who were posing for camera at, at three and four, I mean, I, it's just, yeah. it's the fact that they've already learned about a cell. And that you need recognition mm. in order to have a place. Yeah. yeah. And that it's transient, that recognition. Now, I don't, I don't, I don't mean by saying it's not, we don't look at our infants enough, because I think we do. But there's something about the world being so big and us being so bloody tiny, frankly. We need to be known, but we need to be known. I don't know. You're... Yeah. I don't know how we do it with the level of sort of consumer society at this level of, of I don't, I want to say it's so rampant. It's so ubiquitous. I, I'm not really answering your question. I have to accept that. I'm sorry. No, that's okay. I can only imagine that social media, it's not, not just capitalism and, you know, but also the social media and the eyes on us that way. Um, we're, we're performing yeah. for the world at this point. Yes. And the thing is that if the world sees you, it doesn't actually work. Yeah. It doesn't it doesn't reach that spot? It 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 just doesn't. I mean, it might temporarily, but we know how how dangerous too much celebrity is for for people who've been conventional stars, let alone is these new yeah. platforms. Which, of course, let's not forget, they are commercially driven. 
people yeah. on they're kept on those sites for commercial reasons not because they're um just having a lovely time right you mentioned like a shift in identity and I, I just wanted to share I think the big shift in my identity on this journey was going from the value being admiration I can say that now I wanted to be admired as a teenager in my early 20s even right up to 30 and then kind of around that time was when I was doing some of this work and now what I want more than anything is to feel connected and maybe I thought admiration was going to get that for me maybe not it does feel like it was a bit more ego driven a desire to find a sense of self and good enoughness through admiration and what I see now is how disconnecting admiration is like you say people get this visibility and it doesn't hit something in us that is actually where the yearning comes from it becomes this sort of substitute and an inadequate one absolutely I, I think we, connection is what we all want and that's what social media kind of alleges it offers mm -hmm. and it doesn't quite yeah I and mean yeah, obviously it helps for isolation but hey there's no substitute for mm -hmm. having friends and communities of interest yeah I because you say that now and I feel that now but I've, I've definitely spoken to people about this and they've said no I want the admiration and even seeing those two things side by side like the admiration uh, maybe this is a, a taught thing as well like culturally that that admiration and elevation in other people's eyes is somehow more valuable than the connection maybe just but we grew up with such big I mean certainly my generation grew up with huge billboard pictures all the time right not not screen pictures small green but huge huge iconography of women's bodies and admirate of, of, of looking both adored and won at the same time I mean it, you know and evoking all of these things so I think that kind of thing I mean it'd be very interesting to see what happens to adoration as the pictures get smaller and smaller I mean things have got miniaturized at mm. one level right mm. used to go to the movies and you'd really you'd you'd be blown away by the stars, so to speak. Yeah, hmm. and it's not quite like that anymore. Yeah, they're How in your living you? room. Yeah, in your or pocket. Your bedroom. Yeah, in your pocket. Interesting. I'm I'm curious about what you said earlier in the beginning, where you said that dieting can be that way of taking back agency and autonomy, and and feeling like we have some. So it's almost become, it's a double edged sword then in a way because it's also the way we're taking away. Um, so what are other ways that we find agency and or how have you, um, in the interest of, of sharing store, our stories on this podcast, what other ways do you take, find that autonomy without dieting? Well, I, there's nothing I like better than eating and cooking really and hanging out with friends, mm -hmm. um, and relishing what I'm going to cook or relishing doesn't really matter, but what it is but relishing a something when I'm hungry and I'll get the yen for it and I'll make it or I'll go and find it and so that's a form of real agency for me it's like oh I can do that it's like mm. and I still appreciate being able to do that just like having a really good night's sleep is something which I can't count on but it's a wonderful thing to happen and gives me a sense of strength but I suppose it's connecting with friends talking ideas doing my job, which is to listen to people um, and writing and, you know, politically agitating. So it's all, it's all what I do, really. Agitate away. I mean, there's this idea things seem to be worse in a lot of ways now with more pressures. Do you have hope for like the next few generations? What is your sense, your, if you could find I don't really, but I, I know that's a terrible thing to say. So I get excited by things like Extinction Rebellion and people's engagement with the earth and thinking about how to do this seriously, how we actually have a livable climate, how we have sustainable lives, how we have sustainable relationships and sustainable food and sustainable clothing. And so those are the pluses. But I think the forces, are not, I don't think the world is a very um, benign place. And I don't think it's at all clear that, it's, that this is going to end well. I mean, ordinary people are wonderful. We know there are extraordinary stories of 
generosity and thoughtfulness and going the extra mile and but for the youngsters you're going to have to organize yeah and I don't, I don't think social media is a sufficiently I don't think all joining together in social media is significant I think somehow we've got to stop the world doing what it's doing do you have any advice that you would give for anyone who has a voice in this space like the kind of things we're doing about where you would encourage us to put our attention to be able to make okay we may not be able to make the big structural changes but to be able to make a change and to support the people who are struggling under these pressures well the thing that i've been trying to do so i can only say that and i've been very ineffective is um i've been trying for i've probably 15 20 years to train midwives and health visitors to support mums pregnant mums so that their eating issues and body issues are addressed and they don't pass them on to the next generation. Mm. And I've written government papers on it and I've gone everywhere and talked about it. But the issue of supporting mothers in pregnancy so that they can take this time when actually it is about the last time they're gonna have for themselves for years Mm -hmm. and where they're really important and try to help them so that they can get really interested in their bodies and and the bodies of their babies from a completely different perspective than what you weigh I think would be fantastic and I'll send you the paper if you want to read it or you could just look it up it's called two for the price of one and I wrote it with Holly Rubin who's a colleague and it's on Her Majesty's website yeah we'll pop a link to it in the show notes okay great am I correct in thinking you were involved in the Dove beauty campaign about trying to have different size bodies how did that come about how did you end up being involved well I've been speaking at lots of government summits on the body and getting nowhere that's the short report so I thought okay I should go to the commercial world and I tried that and it didn't work but somehow Dove came to me there were three women at the top of Dove and they came to me and said is it true that beauty companies oppress women and I said, yes, as a matter of fact, it is. So they said, well, how are we, gonna, how are we going to uh, convince Dove not to do that? So I said, well, why don't you go and interview the head of Unilever's daughters mm-hmm. and find out how they feel about their bodies? <laughs> <laughs> and did they, do you know? <laughs> yeah, of course they did. Wow. Yeah. And so they got a huge budget. And then they had... Um, you know, so we did lots of seminars together about how to represent bodies. So we had in, the, in some of the campaigns, you know, there'd be a 94 year old woman with freckles and was she wizened or was she wise? You know, it's trying to move you from your prejudice to an idea that she had something to offer. And we had loads and loads of those campaigns. But more, so I kept thinking, well, if you get all of these visuals better, you still need to do stuff behind the scenes. So it was all of the million, literally millions of workshops that were done with with girls in school around the body and around how to feel okay in their developing sexuality and how to say yes and no and all of those things, which I've never really made a fuss about, but which were, I think, just as important. Um, And okay, so now every beauty company does the visuals, but I don't think they do anything else. But of course... You know, like they do it because they need the profits now and they know now, okay, girls, girls, as we're all called, are going to be bigger now. So we've right. got to show them with their, you know, their bend out, whatever. Any, yeah. So I did it. I did it for a while. And, you know, that was a little foray into the commercial world. Mm-hmm. But it was for political reasons, really. Yeah. And I wrote lots of little booklets for them, for the kids and the mothers, like, you know, how to talk about this stuff. Hmm. Yeah. I think is that available somewhere? Probably on the dog website somewhere. Okay, I'll take a look there. I'll link it below. Yeah. As, I, as I'm listening to you talking about the sort of looking to do the policy change and having a political influence, when I hear you talking about that, I, I sit here thinking there's so much more I could be doing. And then I think about the individual stuff I do and how... I can get so much satisfaction out of the work that I do at the individual level. And I wondered about that for you as well. Well, I think for me, um, I think writing was a way to share what I was doing individually. 
with the outside world and not just in this area but in general mm -hmm. um and then policy is just a source of frustration but it doesn't mean i've completely given up so i mean i've given up i wouldn't work with this government if you well i wouldn't work with this government they're too corrupt mm -hmm. and not interested um but the coalition government was a different story and it was really worth working with them now, I've got to go soonish. I don't know how long no we're scheduled for. We can we can absolutely wrap up now. Is there anything you want to ask or say to end off with, Steph? Um, maybe we just end up like coming off of that question of to anyone listening to this podcast who feels compelled to act either on the personal or systemic level. What is the takeaway? I don't know. You tell them. <laughs> I mean, I, there's so many different takeaways, which is listen to yourself, you know, really try to listen to your body and really dare. I think dare to dare to listen to your hunger and find out what it's about, both food wise and otherwise. Mm. Maybe look at some of the activist websites, like anybody, um, or endangered bodies, I think we've, it's got two names, mm -hmm. uh, any-body.org. And um, join up with friends, start reading books that challenge things or listening to your podcast challenge challenge everything you it's really great i would say as a sort of takeaway it's really great to be curious about yourself and other people and why people fall into thinking that this is the answer to every problem is somehow to reshape one's body and finding out it isn't is really really useful mm -hmm. and we'll start a journey of inquiry that's really very worthwhile keep you going for a long time and then just to end, you said in one of the videos you did for the guardian that actually if parents don't want to pass their body issues on to their kids to stop talking about their bodies and get better at talking about emotional things and I also thought that to me really applies at the individual level as well like if we're doing this work ourselves we can get better at talking about what's going on at the emotional level and at the ideas level and yeah. also when you see your friend and they look great, try and find the right adjectives rather than yeah. the ones that are conventional. Yeah, indeed. Thank you. Well, okay. thank you so much for your time. Susan. Pleasure. Good really luck appreciate with your work, having both you. of you. Lovely thank to you. meet you. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Okay. Bye. 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 I just said lovely to meet you too. I didn't mean to. What did you say? Lovely to meet you too, which I would never say. I meant to say good to meet you. Just sounded. I really, you went off, you went off, ready.